Hey, hey, and welcome to another Tech Tuesday. This is Chad from Ascension Worship. This week we continue our series on transitioning your church uh, to in-ear monitors, and we talk more about sins and talk about tap points. Hey, 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 what do you say? Yes, it's that time again. It's Tech Tuesday. So tap points are just a um, extension of what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about pre-fader and post-fader sins. Uh, a quick recap, if you haven't watched the video, go watch it, but a real quick recap is that pre-fade is uh, a signal that is going from your channel to everyone's ears or wedges or whatever that is unaffected by the fader. So as you turn the fader up and down, that's not affecting the signal going to their ears, but rather the knob that you set, whatever volume you set that to, it's what's gonna go to their ears. Um, and then a post-fade is just the opposite of that. It's um, that volume, plus or minus the volume of your fader is going to affect how much is going uh, to the ears, but you really wouldn't want that to go to the ears in most cases, but you'd want that for things like effects. So that if you have, uh, say, a uh, reverb on your vocal, when you turn the vocal down, it would be turning down that post-fade mix as well so that the reverb will go away and not remain going on on its own. Uh, so there are other options if you're on a digital board uh, that are just a bit more um, in-depth, I guess you could say, and that's what we're going to look at today. So let's take a look here uh, at our handy little chart I made. Uh, over the first few weeks of this series, we talked about the signal chain. Uh, so this is everything we talked about from top to bottom of your signal. You've got your input to your head amp gain. And remember your head amp gain affects everything down the line. Uh, your low cut, your gate, your EQ, your compressor, and then your fader. And then from the fader, it's gonna go out to your left and right mix, your subs, anything that you have it set to that's uh, post fade. So we talked about last week, these two guys right here pre-fade and post-fade mixes. Uh, but if you notice on here, these are on uh, many different consoles, particularly the Behringer X32 or the Midas M32, are the different options of what's called tap points you have. Let me show you that real quick. Obviously we're looking at the, uh, the editing program here and not an actual uh, console, but the concept's the same, it's just instead of changing it with a mouse, you're gonna use a little rotary knob. Uh, so if we click home, uh, I am currently looking at a bass channel from a, um, a service I mixed a few weeks back. Uh, if we go to the sends tab, then you'll see uh, this is where that bass is going for everything. So we had five stereo in-ear mixes that were happening uh, and the bass was going to all those in different levels. Uh, and at the bottom here you have this same list. Uh, and so if you were using a knob, or in this case I'm going to click on it, you can uh, filter through them so uh, you can go to the different ones. So let's talk about what these are. If you notice right now I have these set to input slash LC. And here's your very first one, input slash LC. LC stands for low cut. So what this does is it's sending not just a pre-fade signal, but a pre-everything signal. The only two things that are affecting this from the board are your head amp gain and your low cut filter. Um, this is pretty cool because if you're like me and you're a very particular musician, uh, I know what my bass should sound like with nothing on it because I have a pedal board that I set, you know, what the EQ is going to look like, what the compression is going to sound like, all that stuff I have on my, on my pedal board. And of course, front of house can do whatever they want to do with it. Um, but I don't want their EQ to affect my ears because then I start getting into this EQ tug of war. So we'll, we'll take a look at this again. Um, this wasn't me playing, um, but this will give you an idea. So here's the EQ for that bass. Now, I notched out um, around 124 hertz, uh, and then it looks like I took a little bit out at um, 2.5 kilohertz. Uh, this is mostly probably for the room, uh, what I did here. So there's probably just an overabundance of that frequency in the room, or trying to make the, uh, the bass and the kick fit together a little bit more. It's probably why I did this. 
nothing wrong with that at all. But as a bass player, that might be um, might not sound as good in your ears as it does in front of house. Ooh, excuse me. Get my notifications. Uh, so by having this tap point here, that EQ would not affect my ears whatsoever. Front of house can do whatever they want, but it's not going to affect what I'm hearing. So that's a very useful tool. I would use this on, um, on bass guitars, on uh, electric guitars, and on keyboards, uh, and then any kind of loops that you're running. Um, because the idea is that you are allowing the people on stage to hear exactly what they're sending to you, and you're not fighting back and forth. So if it sounds like garbage in their ears, in a nice way, you can say, hey, it doesn't sound good. Can you make it sound better? And then if they can make it sound awesome in the in-ears without all your processing, then your job as a front of house engineer is going to be much easier because now all you're doing is just kind of making it fit in the overall mix for the band uh, or for the room. But you're not trying to, from scratch, make something sound you know better that doesn't sound great to start with. Uh, now, if you have a brand new musician, maybe we'll keep with bass guitar, and, uh, and their bass doesn't sound very good, and it needs a little bit of compression, that's when you can start going into these other tap points here. So if you wanted, uh, for example, let's say the bass player has a, uh, a lot of buzz when they're not playing, um, and if you had this tap point set up, you could gate it at front of house, and it wouldn't affect their ears, but maybe that buzz is starting to annoy people on stage. Well, that might be where you want to add the gate, so you would go and select the pre-EQ tap. So I could go to my sins, and I can do this for each um, uh, bus independently. Now on the Behringer, everything in groups of two. Um, so if this were the bass player and this were the drummer, they would have to have the same setting. That's fine, that's usually gonna work out. But I can just click on this and change this to pre-EQ, pre-EQ, so that's the gate and everything up. And then we'd want to do that for everybody, usually. Um, if we need to add the EQ or the compression, again, we can go to our tap points and add whatever is going to give us what we need for that signal. Uh, and then you're going to end up at this point here where you're at the pre-fader, which is everything. And I usually use this on um, my drum mics because the EQ and compression and gating uh, are usually going to make that sound better for everybody's ears. And for my vocal mics, excuse me. And the reason why I use it for vocals, uh, and again, unless the vocalist is very particular, uh, usually you're going to want some sort of EQ to... Uh, to just kind of make everything sound better for the band. Um, you may or may not want the compressor in there. That's going to depend on what your team is, is used to and what they want. I like to have it in there. Um, I used to not have that in there, and the team on stage got a little frustrated because some of their less experienced vocalists would get very excited when they start singing really loud. The band on stage was having to adjust their ears to try and turn that person down. Uh, and so I decided I was going to make everything pre-fade, so including compressor and everything above it um, for the vocals. Uh, and then to expand on this more, when you get to the post-fade items, um, as we talked about last week, you're going to want to uh, have that for things that you're sending to effects. But when it comes to people's ears, a few things that you might want to do post-fade would be uh, things that come and go from stage in those important transitionary moments that you don't want to have in your ears all the time particularly the pastor's microphone. So let's say the pastor has a headset mic on and he or she uh, didn't turn it off during worship and is just singing full blast and God bless them, it sounds terrible um, because they're not the worship leader. Uh, so you wouldn't, as a band, want to hear that all the time because it'd be just really confusing and throw you off. But also when the pastor walks on stage, uh, you don't want the band to have to be all turning up their their, um, their mixes, or if you have a monitor engineer or, or you, whoever's gonna turn that up, that's a lot of work. So that would be great to have this post fade so that as you fade the pastor up, as he or she is walking up on stage, um, it will automatically become louder in everybody's ears um, based off of that fader level. Now, of course, using your, your send level, you can adjust how loud it's going to be overall, but it's still going to be affected by the fader. So while the fader's all the way down, 
the past would be uh, essentially muted in their ears, and then as you fade it up, you'll start to hear it more. So you'll use post-fade for things like the pastor's microphone, um, again, transitionary things, so like any kind of announcement mics or MC microphones you're using, uh, and then things like uh, your playback devices. So if the worship leader wants to hear um, church news, you know, when it's happening, um, but you know, if someone's testing it in the background, you don't want to be hearing that when it's not in the house. So you'd have that post fade. And so as you fade that up, everyone in the band's going to hear that. And then just a quick uh, explanation of what this is. Um, this is a subgroup tap. This is the same thing as a post fade tap, except the fact that uh, it doesn't give you any option except for the volume that the fader is sending. So if the fader is at negative two, then the subgroup will be sending a level of negative two. Whereas on a post fade, if the fader is at negative two, but the level um, of the send is negative one, then negative two minus one equals negative three. You'd be sending a level of negative three to the subgroup. But on subgroups, it's only what the fader level is. And then usually if you have a, some sort of panning happening, that will um, come along as well. So I hope this makes sense for you. Um, play around with it, but the easiest way, just a quick recap, is instruments that you want to um, leave as untouched as possible in the band's ears so that they can be working on it to give you as good a signal as possible um, is what you're going to want to have be, uh, be your input tap. Uh, and again, I would typically use that on bass guitar, electric guitar, and keyboards. Um, possibly on acoustic, depending on how good your acoustic guitarist is. If they've got, you know, controls on there to, to set up their own acoustic, um, then that'd be good. But if not, then don't do that. And then um, I usually do, for pretty much everything else, pre-fade. Uh, so the compressor and everything above it. So I use that on mics that need that. So vocal mics, drum mics. Uh, and then, like I said, if an acoustic guitarist or a mandolin or someone like that that needs a little bit of help for it to sound good in everybody's ears, that's a good point to do that. And then finally, the post fader tap. Uh, I use that on things that come and go, transitions. Uh, so the pastor's microphone, any announcement microphones, and any playback devices. Again, this is Chad from Ascension Worship. I hope this has been helpful for you and your team. Come back here every Tuesday for new information.